Welcome to this edition of Pep Chat with Burning with Texas A&M Agri-Loft Extension Service. We're glad you joined us today. The gang is back together and we're here to talk about migration and where birds live. Do birds really have homes? Watch and learn. Here we go. Good morning everyone and welcome to Burning with Extension Pep Chat. I did that backwards. I guess being off a week has really messed me up. So and um, the gang is back in town. We are all here. Maureen, welcome back. We're happy to have you. Brian, and it's, I feel like it's just like a little family reunion. So um, I guess, how, how is everyone? Let's start with that. How is everyone this morning? Maureen? I'm really excited about my cup. Oh, I showed this to Emily already. Let me get a It doesn't show stuff. very well. Maybe turn your light off and see if it shows oh, better. So. Let's see. Okay. Oh, it does. Oh, so much better. Oh, it has, a lid. I love the lid idea. Yes. And it kind of keeps it warmer for longer. Maybe not a whole lot longer, but mainly it's just adorable because they're little ears. So I know it's not Easter anymore, but it's, I thought it was cute. So I think it's absolutely gorgeous. I think that's awesome. Brian, let's all know, did you wake up enough time to have coffee or tea this morning? <laughs> I absolutely did not know. <laughs> we all knew that answer before we even asked the question. <laughs> you know, the last couple of times I've had a, I've had something to drink, but not this morning, no. <laughs> I'm not feeling it. And I'll tell you what, you both would be very proud of me. I've not been to Starbucks in three weeks, maybe. It's quite comical. But wow. I am making my coffee at home. So I know it's a big step for me. I am still using Starbucks coffee creamer in my coffee. Mm -hmm. Of course, now, let's be honest. So let's really quickly talk about when we're talking about cups and teas and things like that. First, want to say thanks to Birds and Beans. We are, I want to say, I'm just going to call it two weeks. We are two weeks away from burning the border. And so we're one week, I'm going to keep calling it two weeks because counting the days is messing me up at this point. So we're about two weeks away from burning the border. And we're super excited to have everyone joining us. Um, but we're really want to thank Birds and Beans for donating um, bird-friendly coffee for our early worm coffee bar. Um, and so everyone who comes out and is going to go out on trips with us in the early wee hours of the morning will be able to grab a cup of bird-friendly coffee before they head out and maybe just a little bit of breakfast. So um, super excited about that. Maureen, can I, before we jump into our, our topic of the day, migration, yeah, share with us the difference between bird-friendly coffee and the regular coffee yeah and yeah. i think we're actually gonna have to do a cup chat on this maybe we'll i don't know we can talk to the birds and beans folks or i'll see if there's somebody we can get you know who studies this but um bird friendly coffee is shade grown coffee and so when you grow in a like a traditional coffee setting there all the rainforest vegetation that's there that all of the birds are used to having is taken out and then the coffee is just grown basically in a monoculture like how we think about row crops you know it's just all the same um and that is something that very few species of birds can live in and so it really impacts the the birds use of that area it really takes away a lot of habitat from them um and shade grown coffee is you keep you know, for the, obviously you're taking out some things because you're putting a new tree there for the coffee tree, but you're keeping that overstory vegetation that birds really rely on. And the coffee can be grown like that. Um, I, some people say it tastes a little different or even better. I'm not enough of a coffee connoisseur to have, you know, to tell the difference. But, um, but yeah, it, it just keeps that, um, that vegetation diversity so that you can have more species of birds. It's a it's a big difference. I don't know any of the statistics, but we'll have to have somebody on to talk about that. So. That's true. We should. But today we are going to talk about migration. We have seen on Facebook everyone's super excited about the birds coming to their yards, um, seeing their their migrate migratory species come through. Last night I got a picture of a um of a bunting. A painted bunting? No, a lazoo. A, a lazoo. Oh, yeah. I got a picture from of a lazoo bunting here in Barberty County. Um, so we are hearing about all your migratory birds and seeing it on Facebook. But I think one thing that we wanted to kind of talk about is a little bit about migration. Um, and especially when we think about birds' homes. Like, 
And this may be a little bit of a stretch. And so I'm just gonna go with it. Everybody ride on the boat with me for a second. So when I think about migration, I feel like there are some birds that don't have homes, like a cardinal. No, the, a cardinal has a home. We call them, because we call them resident birds. They stay here, they live here, they have homes. But there are, but some birds just seem like they migrate all the time. So do birds have homes? That's the first question. Up for so, anyone's uh, yeah. yeah, so I think first it's important that we think about Oh, should like you say, should, we, should you share your concept of migration first about the winter and spring migration or wait? Well, it's kind of, we'll kind of integrate it. Okay. Because I okay. like that one. You should tell everybody. It's a good joke. Okay. We will. It's we'll maybe the, your, your best work joke. Ever. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so first kind of let's talk about the concept of a home because like I would say, I mean, I live in the same house all the time. I travel a lot, but I live in the same house. So that would... I would say that's my home, but for different people, it's different. It's different in other countries. I think we have to remember that sometimes or different cultures or even just within this country. If you think about the community where Brian grew up in Brackettville, a lot of people that live there are snowbirds. So they have their winter home and they have their summer home, like a lot of our birds. So if you ask them, which is your home? Some people may have one that they say is like their favorite. You know, a lot of people like if they're from Texas, and their summer home is up in Wisconsin or wherever, they'll be like, well, Texas is truly my home. And the Wisconsin people would say the opposite when they come down to Texas, but that's a very human concept. Like, I don't, I mean, we don't know because we can't ask the birds, but if you asked a bird like, hey, which is your home? I don't know that they have a favorite, you know? I know, and so, that's my point. Do they have a home? Yeah, so in that sense, the migratory ones really don't. Um, but I think when we talk about the concept of like, coming back to the same place because if we think about you know people migrating so people going to Brackettville you know uh to wherever up north and coming back um people going you know Texas Colorado all the places they go most of them are going you know to the same spot now there's some that like they like to be around in an RV and if I had thought about this we could have come up with like our list of species of birds maybe Brian can do this better on the spot than I can you've got like your 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 resident birds and then like or your like you know your single place birds and your you're migrating back and forth people and like your RV birds. Um, but the, a lot of people, it's like, you've got a house here and a house here. And birds often do have that site fidelity um, where they're going to be, they migrate and they spend a lot of their year going back and forth. But when they get to their breeding grounds, they want to be in that area. And maybe sometimes even in that tree or when they get to their winter grounds, we don't know as much actually about wintering and like if they spend the same, if they, if they like to go to the same spot, but definitely for the summer, breeding is so important that when you get an individual who is able to say, this is my tree, this is why the birds sing, right? Is it's the territoriality thing. And so they're like, this is my tree. It's the best tree. I know that I successfully raised six babies here last year, you know, had two clutches or whatever. I want this tree again because it worked last year. And so in that sense, they do have a home a lot of the time. And that's why when we, there's so many different things we can talk about here with migration, but um, the importance of birds arriving, you know, early to an area, those birds- So the, their the tree doesn't arrive, get taken. Right, and the ones who arrive, there's a balance, right? Because if you arrive too early, probably no food. But if you <laughs> arrive too late, your tree's gone or, you know, whatever area that you're gonna breed in for, you know, a lot of our shorebirds that breed like up in the Arctic, it's more like you're, patch of tundra it's not a tree. Um, but but it's very important that they get there to claim that spot so brian your thoughts about birds having homes i mean i think that maureen just really comprehensively covered it right there um you know and just to kind of go on that sort of rv i guess example um there definitely are species particularly um during their non-breeding seasons that just kind of wander. Um, and one of those species that comes to mind is prairie falcon, um, especially um, the ones we get in Texas, it seems like um, when they're there for the winter, th they might be in this one area this week and then the next week they're gone somewhere else. Um, they just kind of wander around with no sort of winter home range, it seems like. Um, but yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think that, a lot of migratory birds, like Maureen was saying, kind of have 
two distinct homes, you know, that, that breeding site that they come back to every single year and that winter site that they go back to every single year. Um, and that's kind of why it's important. Um, when we think about habitat conservation, we don't, you know, a lot of times us in America, we think about, you know, what do we need to preserve here? And that's really important. You know, that's a breeding habitat for a lot of species, but for that species to really survive, we have to think about, you know, that winter range as well. That's equally as important as well as, you know, all the migratory stuff in between, so. And this is kind of like a new understanding for people, again, just, you know, like from our North American perspective, we haven't thought much about that winter conservation, but as we've done more here to help our breeding populations, but some of our birds are still struggling, it has really been brought to people's attention of like, oh, it's not just this that matters. So to tie it into our shade grown coffee, um, that's often happening in an area where birds spend the winter. And so if you have, you know, we've done this great conservation for these species that are here breeding, and we know that breeding is important, right? Because it makes more birds, but if then they go to their wintering grounds and a lot of them are not gonna make it because that's been, you know, impacted for whatever reason, then we're not, the, there's still conservation needs. So that, um, both that wintering and then the migration, as, as Brian mentioned, that was my dissertation research, was those areas that are like that, you know, a stopover area, a refueling area for birds. If we don't have those, same thing, because migration is so energetically costly that if you're, you know, flying hundreds and hundreds of miles and you don't have a good place to get food, uh, you know, for us, if you don't, if you miss a road stop, you're just going to be cranky. For the birds, when you're actually powering yourself through that, um, they're not going to live. So, absolutely. So, I actually got on um, <clears throat> Bird App and I was looking, and I think that I'm going to stray from both of you on the answer of the birds of homes. Y'all ready? Because on our migration maps, or our range map, we have kind of four categories. Migration, breeding, non-breeding, and year-round. And so to me, if a bird doesn't have a year-round home, they're moving. They're an RV bird. So they don't technically, they live in an RV, they don't live in a home. They're trapped. Yeah, although I think you do break down the RV birds too. Like Brian was saying, like the prairie falcon, that's like truly like moving, 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 moving. As opposed to some of our migrants, like, you know, like the Lazuli bunting that you saw, like he's, he's headed somewhere or, you know, and so they'll have like, you know, their, their Colorado home and their Texas home. And so they do have more of a home because he's headed to one place and then he's in a different place. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about um, our, like when you see on a range map and it says breeding, what necessary, I mean, obviously that is where they're breeding. And that is where they're going to in the spring, Ryan, right? Right. For mm -hmm. us here, um, I guess it's true everywhere. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the breeding uh, range is typically where they're seen in spring and summer. Yeah. And they migrate back. And so you have the migratory migration range. That's where they can be seen while they're migrating back. And right. then they go to their non-breeding range, typically in the winter. And then... It goes back and forth, back and forth. So right. let's, what are maybe the key concepts of migration that people need to understand um, as they are looking for new birds in their yard um, or they're interested in maybe tracking down to see a specific bird somewhere? Um, I mean, speaking, I mean, just in general terms, like coming out here, um, I, I pulled up the, les say it because I can't say it. Lazuli. 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 Well, I like Lazuli better. You can say Lazuli. I think that's equally good. Lazuli. It's like painted bunnies. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I tell you what, I was talking about that to somebody yesterday the other day is that, and if everyone hasn't figured out, if I can't say the word, like if it's not a normal word, it does not come out right of my mouth. Like, I, no matter how much I try, my ability to say, uncommon words mm -hmm. is zero so I just it just doesn't work for me. so um even after you say it a bunch I will still get it completely wrong so the looking at the lazuli the, the 
the bunting. Um, <laughs> now, now I've lost my train of thought. Oh, wow, where it, was I going with that? I actually, um, you know, my uh, birding moms kind of often have that same problem. And when we were doing a tour in New Mexico, we were having trouble with the word ferruginous for a ferruginous hawk. And so we just ended up calling it the effing hawk. But, you know, everyone <laughs> knew what we were talking about, so it really didn't matter. But, um, yeah, I think um, I can speak to that a little bit as far as um, thinking about um, what's important for birds during migration and, like, finding birds during migration. Yeah, and so that's what I was talking about. I was like, you know, the lazuli bunting, mm -hmm. the L bunting, the not quite all blue bunting, but blue enough that I care because I like bluebirds. Uh -huh. <clears throat> you look at its line on the range map and it's technically not supposed to get we're a little far west here in Valverde County or east here in Valverde County for him to kind of show up and do his thing here and migrate through so how would um so I think that that's interesting as we look at migratory species really not following their maps either right so um one thing to keep in mind with that um is that range maps especially in field guides um are sort of uh you know they get dated quickly for one thing um and then they're also just kind of generalizations right so they're not maybe going to tell you exactly accurately where these birds can be found um and i think that um when you're thinking about um you know say you're trying to find a lazuli bunting um, this spring as it's migrating through Texas to its breeding grounds in the Rockies, um, you want to think about a few different things. So, you know, what is that bird needing? You know, it's a seed eating bird. So someplace that has seed available or a bird feeder or, you know, a patch of nice grass that's gone to seed um, would be a good place to look. Um, and then you want to also think about migration timing, right? So not all birds, not all of our, you know, warblers and buntings and grosbeaks and everything, they don't all migrate at the same time in the same week, you know? Okay. It's fine. <laughs> right. Um, and so, like, for instance, um, back when I was in college, I really wanted to see a cerulean warbler which is this Eastern warbler. They're, you know, really in steep decline. Really, it's another blue bird. Um, and I was so excited to see one. And I had to time my trip to the coast um, in order to maximize my potential for finding one. Um, and so I had to go in earlier in April um, to look for them because they're an earlier migrant. Um, you know, they do- Early in warbler? Uh -huh they do occur um, pretty much throughout the migration period from early April to early May, but their peak um, movement is on the earlier to mid half of April. Um, so, you know, keeping that in mind, that's when I scheduled my trip and then we found one. Um, so, you know, there's a lot, a lot of things to think about when you're trying to track down migrants. Um, and another one, uh, another good tip I guess, um, is to think about um, how, you know, what habitat is near you that will attract <laughs> these migrating birds, right? So if you live in the South Texas brush country um, and there's just that thorn scrub habitat for miles and miles all around, but then you have this spring and this creek that has these huge oak trees and pecan trees and this lush understory all along it, you know, that's going to bring in and attract those migrating birds because that is signaling to them, look, there's a lot of food resources here and water and things that I can use to refuel. Um, so, you know, thinking about habitat is also really important. That's so true. Uh, and I'll add too, as, can you hear me still? Yes, yeah, so sorry. But we didn't know if you were back or not. No, no, I'm here. I'm, I'm still here. I've been here the whole time. Um, the, uh, <laughs> um, one of the things to think about too, when you're trying to find a species, it can be really helpful when you're looking at those those peaks. Because if you're just looking at a map, you know it doesn't show you like that necessarily that peak time. 
But on eBird, for any given species and location, you can look. And if you click, when you click the, the hot spot that shows up on eBird, if you click bar charts, it shows you, um, you know, what for any given species, like how often they're in that area. And the, the size of the bar tells you like how frequently, so you can kind of figure out that peak. I don't know if I'm going to do a great job explaining this, but I'm going to pull it up so that I can share my screen and show you all. So we can come back to that, but I want to show you what it looks like. Okay. Well, <clears throat> um, how fast are you sharing your screen or not? Pretty quickly. Here, hold on. Actually, you know what? Let me share it from now because um, that way y'all can see how I get there in case people aren't familiar with using eBird. Okay, so this is when you first type in eBird, you land on this site. And so let's say I want to, you, you're going to click explore. Um, and if we click on either, I'm actually going to go to hotspots because you're probably looking at like a, spe a specific place that you might want to see this species. So let's say I'm in Uvalde and Cook Slough is an amazing place to see um, birds here in Uvalde. Oh, it's not going to show up. Oh, you could like share one of them. Uh, that's a better idea. Let's, let's share the duck pond because we know that the duck pond is an awesome place right in Valverde County. Oh. And it is one of the few sites that we have trips left for. And while registration is closed online, you can call us if you are interested in one of those sites and we will see about getting you in. Um, hey, I am it was the first one that popped up there, Maureen. Yeah. Oh, was it? Uh -huh. When I typed in Cienegas? Uh -huh. Oh, if you move home, it's still Cienegas. Yeah, it's way challenging. There we go. You're right. Cienegas Terrace Duck Ponds. Okay. So when I type in a location, then this is what pops up. and then see this part too, it says bar charts. If I click on that, then we get these bar charts. And so um, if we want to filter it so that we can say, okay, I'm really, really interested in what I might see while I'm there during birding quarter, we can actually change our date and say, okay, I just wanna see what's there during spring migration. So March through May. Now this is only gonna pop up the species that are there March through May, but you can see these bars are telling us how frequently that species is seen there. Now, sometimes in places that haven't been birded as frequently, this is gonna be a little bit off because you can see this black-bellied whistling duck. It looks like, okay, maybe they're not there for some of the summer and they're there in February, but they're not there in March. This is probably just because they haven't been seen there. This area hasn't been birded enough for them to show up there because they're there in March. But for other species um, like the blue-winged teal, you can see they're only passing through during April and their best time to see them is gonna be earlier in April because we've got that bigger bar. I'm gonna scroll down to some of our other, um, our warblers and species. Do, do, do. Oh, again, this, play, this just hasn't been birded a whole time, but if we look at some of our sparrows, you, want, you can see that there's this time. Doesn't mean that you might not see one the last week of March, but first week of April, you've got that bigger bar. You've got a much better chance that you're gonna see um, the yellow-breasted chat if you go during that first week of April, I really kind of shoot for the middle of April there. So. Well, and I, you know, looking at that chart and knowing the property, you know, that's one thing that I'm so excited about is the back portion of the property where we will be going for burning the border has not been burned a whole lot other than by us. And I don't know that I have allowed when we've gone birding, maybe once have we actually like, oh, wow. Birded, birded that. And I guess that to me is the difference is we just, um, I'm excited to see what, when we actually bird the duck pond. I know we've birded it, but like. Yeah. We've scouted it, but we haven't spent time finding everything that we could find. Right, right, right. We, we have got, you know, lots of people don't understand when we have, A, Valverde County is huge um, and we have, six sites to get already in Kinney County within two days, maybe three sometimes. There's just not a ton of time to bird because Brian would like to spend four hours there or more than that. And I don't have I don't have five hours to get him onto the first So <clears throat> I'm excited to see that. But going back to our topic of migration and looking at um looking at migration like so one thing i talked about was do birds have homes so like the northern northern cardinal so this bird does not migrate 
It does not have breeding ground. It does not have non-breeding ground. It just has year around, but it's such a large area. <clears throat> Do Northern Cardinals migrate within their area and move? Or do they just literally live like the one who sings every morning outside of my house? Does he just live here all the time? Um, I'm not sure, actually. Um, I, I know you gave me this assignment, but I didn't look it up. Um, if there are okay. I'm on movements it. within their population or not. Um, I know that, you know, just anecdotally speaking, speaking from my time living in South Texas, we would see many more around during the winter um, and I don't know if that's um, you know just local birds moving to areas of higher resources or if it was you know actually birds coming from somewhere up north and you know spending the winter there um, I'm not sure so I'm gonna go ahead and tackle that I don't actually specifically know for cardinals but we do have species that have both resident and migratory individuals. So the best example of this, and this is what I know because kind of from the wildlife damage management side, is Canada geese. So if we think about wanna... Canada geese, just geese in general, but Canada geese in particular, they're like a classic like migratory, like symbol of fall. You know, you think about, oh, it's fall because flocks of geese are passing overhead. They really used to all migrate, um, but since, people have changed habitats in so many areas that has caused a lot of them to be residents. So like where I grew up in Colorado, if you think about what Colorado used to look like in the winter, there were not resources for them there. But because we now maintain things like golf courses and lawns and all of those kinds of things, now there are resources for them year round. So there are our Canada geese that will live there year round. There's also still some that migrate. Um, so there's places that, you know, if you're farther north, you may still have some, you may still only have Canada geese in, um, in, the, in the summer, especially in particular areas, you know, if it's, it's a kind of more of a natural habitat. Um, uh, a few years ago, the Wildlife Society Conference was up in uh, Winnipeg, and, you know, the geese were kind of the only thing left there, but they were even headed out, you know, when we went out to this marsh. Um, but when you come a little bit farther south and you've got those resources year round, like Brian's saying, you might have them there year round, but you'll get more of them in the winter months because there are some that are migrating. So I'm going to challenge you again because <clears throat> Canadian geese, their range map does show that they migrate. Northern Cardinals range maps just says year round, they're everywhere right here. Yeah, so, and so that, that's one that I don't know. That's I should have looked that, that up. I'll have to do some research and post um, later. I don't know whether Northern Cardinals are, you know, like Brian was saying, do, are we seeing um, more of them in the winter because they're coming into particular resources? Or do we have some that are truly not, you know, they're, true, they're moving, um, you know, we're getting more of them in the winter. I don't know. I actually just, I just remembered, um, I guided, um, a trip up in northern Minnesota in the middle of winter and I happened to see a cardinal and it was kind of a rare thing because they are only there in the summer breeding months so they are somewhat migratory. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So they are somewhat migratory within their range area. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. That makes sense. That's what I thought. I thought that that was like a for people in northern climates that it's like kind of a sign of like one of the first birds to come back is the cardinal. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think just on the was, very far, far, far northern edge of that range. Of that range, yeah. That I do think sense. it's odd, as common as cardinals are here, that cardinals are not on the west coast. I would not think that the cardinal would discriminate in terms of habitat. I mean, if it lives here in Valerie County, surely it would live in California. That's a whole other discussion. Actually, this could be a hot topic. So, um, like it's it's kind of like a subset of speciation, but like when species arrive in a new area, uh, like we can talk about cattle eaters, Brian, because those are something that are not quote unquote native to the U.S., but they got here on their own. And so, you know, when do we say that a species is native versus not native? Cardinals, there's a variety of reasons why they might not be on the West Coast. If we introduce them over there, it's a terrible idea. Nobody introduced cardinals where they don't already belong. But if we introduced them there, would they be established and and you know or if they get there on their own 
but it's because of something we've done. The best example of this is not birds, but Emily, you'll like this, squirrels, cute little fluffy mammals. The Eastern Fox Squirrel did not used to be all across the US like it is now. Um, when I was growing up in Colorado, we were so excited. The first time we saw a squirrel, we were like, oh my gosh, there's a squirrel in the backyard. And now they completely overrun everything. They got there on their own, but the reason they got there is because people planted trees across the Great Plains where there used to be none and allowed them to get there from the eastern part of the U.S. So that's I. Now we just came up with a, another hot topics topic. I would bet money, knowing that cardinals live here, if they got to the West Coast and lived in California, I bet they could live in California. I think they probably could, and so we can talk about why species don't get to particular areas sometimes. But yeah, this is like a whole other. It's already a plot, and I have something else I want to say, and this is a whole other. A whole other conversation for sure. We uh, trust me, there's at least a half hour of that topic. Don't worry, we'll, we'll bring it back for another day. So, anyways, yeah. okay, what were you going to say? What, what was your next thought on migration? Well, I want to share a little bit about just this conservation idea and how we can help birds as they're going along their migration because something that I mentioned as far as that arrival early to the breeding grounds and that you know, birds have to time that carefully with when are the resources available, but they also want to be the first one. Um, something that's a big challenge right now is that because of climate change, there can be a lot of mismatch there. And so if you've got a bird that's like, okay, pretty much, you know, um, when I get to this area, there's great food resources the first week of April. And so the, the, the best breeders of that species are getting there first week of April, first week of April, first week of April. And now that has shifted to where some of the resources, um, some of the plants maybe are changing to be available the week before. Um, but not all of the resources are available the week before, or there's resources early, but there's also an, an increased likelihood that you're going to have that inclement weather event that could, you know, that could be deadly to those birds. That's a big challenge. And so when we're thinking about our backyard bird conservation, and also this, this concept, you know, this migration being so energetically costly, what can we do to help? I'm going to tie this back to our, the earlier chat about um, native plants. That is so, so, so important. It, you know, what can you do in your backyard? You know, you think about, oh man, climate change, you know, what am I gonna do in my backyard? What you can do right now today is plant some native plants because the more resources that we can make available to those birds that are what they really truly need, the better their chances of survival. And so as they're going through and they need, um, I think y'all talked about with native plants, the thing that they provide is insects, you know, high densities of caterpillars and stuff which I wish I'd had my phone the other day. We saw a wicked huge caterpillar on our oak tree. And it was, I was just like, man, a bird would be like, it's like a whole day's worth of food for it. Um, but, you know, those having those resources makes it way more likely that they will survive. And we have done a great job conserving our breeding areas. We have not done a great job conserving our uh, stopover and staging areas, which the difference of stopover and staging is just kind of like how long a bird is going to spend at that site. Um, but we, what we can start doing is making our backyards more friendly to birds so that we are conserving and providing those resources along the route. So that's what I would encourage people to do from like the management perspective, um, is it really when we talk about migration drives home the importance of having native plants in your yard. Well, I think that that's an interesting um, interesting that you bring that up in talking about stopovers. What do you call them? Stopovers and stayovers? Staging areas. So staging stopovers areas and, staging. and staging areas. So like stopovers, what I guess will help us relate this. We're going to go back to our RV discussion. Stopovers are when they actually get out, set up their RV and kind of look around for a while. Staging areas is literally, we're going to stop for a day and then move on. We're not going to go on and set all the set the whole RV up and we're not going to go explore. Right. Yes. Yeah. Stopovers. You're going to be there for a longer period of time. Yep. Yeah. You got You got up the awning and the camp chairs and you're going to hang out for a little while. Yeah. Yes. Cause okay. Funny thing. Those of you who own an RV and I do not own an RV, but my grandparents did years ago. The awning is the worst part to set up and pick up because they always, so that must be staging birds never put out the awning. Because there is always the chance you're never ever going to get it put back up. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't thought about what a good example that would be, but yes, I think that's our to continue our RV bird analogy. The, the uh, staging ones don't put out their awning. Yes, the awnings are always they can always come with problems. 
So, um, well, we have had, it's about 8.06, Brian, any of the last thoughts on migration? Um, I guess my, 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 this is my closing statement. You can have a closing statement. Okay. This is my closing statement. Um, you know, one thing to keep in mind is, you know, as we were talking about range maps before and, um, you know, different birds coming at different times and all of that stuff. Um, this is just an exciting time to be a birder because new things are coming every day. Um, and so I would, you know, encourage everyone to go out and be birding and check those um, really rich habitats that are near you. Um, and, you know, even if you're just going to the same exact spot every day, I think it's really cool just to watch um, over the next month or so how, you know, the species that you see there are going to just wildly drastically change over that month. Um, so I just think it's an exciting time and I encourage everyone to go out um, and bird a lot and I think you can learn a lot, so. Absolutely, Maureen, final th closing thoughts on migration today. Yeah, I, look, I even came back on video for my final closing thoughts. Um, I appreciate you joining us back. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, well, so we didn't get to what you said is my your favorite of my work jokes. So this is actually, oh, but- Everyone but, hears your work jokes. Well, we're going to tie it in because it's actually already after eight o'clock. We're going to tie it until next week. You have to come back next week if you want to hear Emily's favorite of my work jokes. Because next week, we're basically just talking about how excited we are for burning the border and how ready we are. And the joke has to do with why it's so awesome to be here in the springtime. So that's my closing statement is you have to come back next time to hear. Uh, Wait, next week is not the week of burning the border. No, 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 it's the week before because the week of Birding the Border, we are not doing cup chat. Everybody needs to know we'll be in the field. We'll be up to our eyeballs in registration and everything. And so there will be no cup chat the week of Birding the Border. But you're right, I said that wrong. Next week is the week before. Come on and say hi, but we're not going to stay for 30 minutes. We won't have time. For that. You can just have a picture of like our eyeballs with all of this preparation yeah. stuff. We could go, we could be uh, live on our drive out to the devils that morning. That's so true because Brian. Right, <laughs> right. Brian will be driving. Emily and I will be back. There will be no cell service. Yeah. Anyhow, you have to come back next week to hear about why we're so excited. Why it's basically why spring migration is better than fall migration. Oh. Maureen, as as told by Maureen. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Well, and Carlos, our guy that is down in Panama that joined us for Cup Chat a couple, um, I guess, weeks ago, months ago, maybe. Um, he has said he is sending all the birds back. From Panama to North America. So he has told me that they have starting to leave Panama in our Facebook comments. But thank you, Carlos, for giving us an update. Um, if you could tell us exactly when they would be here and exactly what, where they would be, it would be extra helpful. But we are excited that they are coming back and we will send them back to you this winter. So um, anyways, it was great to have the gang back. Um, and we are super excited about being two weeks away from burning the border. And we promise after burning the border, we will not mention burning the border for like a week and a half. Um, <clears throat> and we will talk a little bit about some of our other programs that we have coming up here in 2021. We have a couple of fall programs. Um, well, what we're going to be really excited about after burning the border is our youth camp. And we still have spots. So if you know a youth, please encourage them to sign up because that's going to be our next big thing. And we're excited for that too. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So we're going to be at Camp the end of May, starting of June. And we have some fall programs that we'll start talking about. So we promise for at least a week and a half after burning the border, we will not discuss burning the border. Well, we should do a recap cup chat. I mean, it would be cool yeah. to talk about. Actually, I think that's literally what it says on the calendar is recap. <laughs> okay. So we lied. So we will talk about burning the border for two weeks after burning the border. And then we will mention it again for at least another week. So, um, we are excited to meet everyone who is coming uh, to Burning the Border. If you have not registered for Burning the Border, we do have a few select spots available. Online registration is closed, but you can call us and we will try to work with you um, to get you registered if, it is, if you'd like to still come down and join us. But if you are still not comfortable traveling, can't make it, we have added a virtual component um, to Birding the Border. Um, it is a virtual birding seminar of our afternoon session on Saturday. And Maureen is going to tell you the titles. 
I don't know the all the official titles. They're not on the top of my head. But basically, basically, our in our our virtual titles will be or our virtual uh, speakers will be. Um, I'm drawing a blank, Emily. It's too oh, early I've in the morning. It. I've got it. I've got it. There's just so many things on the list, guys. You have to forgive us that we don't remember everything always. Um, okay, our virtual speakers, which I'm super excited. I think these these speakers are going to be absolutely yeah. wonderful, and I love the topic. So. The first one is Dr. Scott McWilliams, and he's going to be talking about the nu nutritional and physiological ecology of migratory birds and why that matters. So um, this was my push, I guess not this topic, but this was my topic push for Marine Defined, because I think nutrition is something that we talk a lot about with our domesticated animals, livestock, your pets. Think about how many pet commercials there are for pet foods, but we don't necessarily discuss supplemental feeding nutritional needs. I mean, we talk about putting out seed and, and our thistle feeders and all of that, but what are we actually feeding the nutrition, the nuts and bolts of it? So I'm super excited to hear that talk. Um, don't make fun of me, but I think that nutrition is a little bit fun. Conversations, especially um, in my other life as a livestock person, um, I'm excited to hear the nuts and bolts of nutrition on a bird level. So, uh, and I'll say, cool. so I guess that makes me crazy. Dr. McWilliams is, because this is something that a lot of people don't study, Dr. McWilliams is coming to us from Rhode Island. And so that's kind of the cool thing about doing this um, virtually and hearing what he has to say about that. Um, sorry, my brain kept thinking Dr. McScott, and that's why I couldn't tell you his name because, and I knew that wasn't right. Um, so Dr. Scott McWilliams coming to us all the way from, um, from Rhode yeah. Island. Um, but then, and then our second speaker, can I say the second person, Emily? Sure, she's, but now you remembered them. Yeah, because now I remember them. Well, I, I remembered the second one. I couldn't get past the Dr. McScott, which wasn't great. Um, <laughs> I think of Dr. McDaniel off of Grey's Anatomy, so. Yeah, so the second, that's okay. the second speaker um, is Dr. Grace, and she is a, a professor at um, Texas A&M, and she's, okay, I don't remember her exact title, but she's basically going to be talking, go ahead and share the title, Emily, since you have them pulled up. It is the modern canary in a coal mine, birds with indicators of eco ecological health in the 21st century. Yeah, and so um, Dr. Grace is going to be talking about how you can look at the um, all these like health indicators in birds and how it indicates the health of the overall environment. So that's a lot of her research focuses on that topic. And as I'm trying to find these on the website, I need to make it easier to get to these. <laughs> I'm going to make that edit on the website today. So it's like really obvious if you want to sign up for the virtual trips, although we'll also put the link on Facebook um, that you can find these, um, these seminars more easily. So with that, with our virtual birding seminar, we are super thankful that is sponsored by Vortex. Um, actually, all of our birding seminars um, at Birding the Border are sponsored by Vortex. I'm super thankful for their partnership. And the cool thing is everyone who registers and attends our seminars, whether you are in person or virtual, will be entered to win a, a Vortex scope. And of course, you're going to want to know exactly what scope. And I would have to look that up this morning. Again, too many things on the list. Um, but we will make sure that that is very obvious on our registration site. So the virtual birding seminar costs $10 and you get a chance to win um, a Vortex scope. Um, if you are coming in person, you still get the same opportunities uh, to win that Vortex scope as well. So we're excited about that opportunity. So tell your friends, um, Carlos, I want to see you on our virtual birding seminar. I'm calling you out right here on Cup Chat. I know you are watching from Panama. Um, I am going to get you to burning the border one day from Panama. Don't you worry. Um, but this year, I want to see you on our virtual burning seminar. So challenge for you, Carlos. Brian, you want to challenge anybody to be on our virtual burning seminar? I think we should start a challenge. That's a good idea. Um, I'll have to think about it. I don't want to put anyone in the hot seat today. I'll stop my Oh, head. my gosh. Come on. Challenge up. I'm waiting. I don't know. Oh, I have someone for you to challenge, but I'll challenge him on for you. I don't know if Marky is watching, but Marky, we should tell her to be on our virtual birding seminar. She was a speaker on our last one, and we should challenge her to be on this one. Yeah, that's right. You know, just totally ignore all of your college finals and just come watch our virtual seminars. But right. okay, she doesn't have to ignore her college finals, Brian. That's harsh. <laughs> She would also get a link to watch the recordings. Oh, true. 
Okay. There yeah. You go. So if you can't necessarily make it on May 1st from 2 30 to 4 30 p.m. to watch the virtual birding seminars, we do send you a link afterwards with the recordings for you to view. So you don't necessarily have to join us live. While we would prefer that because we'd love to hear from you and have our speakers be able to answer your questions, um, you can join as a recording. So um, I think that's all we've got to talk about today. We have definitely gone over our time. Um, Maureen, final thoughts before we say goodbye? Nope, we're good. <laughs> I know, I'm so late. We kind of got off on, I was ready to talk about the virtual birding seminar. No. Mm -hmm. But see, we're, we're coming back next week to continue to talk about how excited we are for Breeding the Border, which means we'll probably talk more about the, the seminar because that's something that anybody can join. And we don't just want to talk about the things that not everyone can join because that's just not fun. But. That's true. It is fun for all. So, Brian, any closing thoughts other than saying goodbye and have a good rest of the week? Um, <clears throat> yeah. Okay, well, and you know, Brian, I hate to embarrass you again and make you sit on the spot, but we do um, have to tell you how thankful we are that you are an integral part of this team today. Um, these past couple weeks have been very crazy getting ready, and so publicly, here's our big, big thank you to you for always helping and being a part of our team um, where the pay is nothing and the reward <laughs> is as much as it, the pay is what gets, makes your heart happy. So. Um, we're so thankful that you are a part of our team and couldn't do it without you. So happy to help, happy to be a part of the team. Absolutely. So everyone have a great Wednesday and we will talk to you next Wednesday on Cup Chat when we are going to talk about a little bit about why we're so excited about breaking the border, why we choose the dates that we choose. Um, Maureen's going to share her best work joke. Um, I think it's funny. I make her tell it all the time. And, we my voice. and, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the virtual birding seminar. Hey, maybe Maureen can get our speakers on for a little bit. That was, that was running through my brain. I wasn't going to say it, but I'll see what I can do. So maybe we'll hear from our speakers a little bit about uh, from our virtual birding seminar and have a little bit of their background. So everyone have a great Wednesday. Thank you for tuning in and we'll see you next week. Bye guys. <laughs>